All right. I don't know what's wrong with this Facebook, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So I want to unmute you both. All right. Welcome to episode 13 of the discussion. Um, my name is Maurice Stewart. I have my co-host here, Gerard Lindsay. Uh-oh. Hey, what's going on, everyone? All right. And then we have a special guest. And I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, hey, thanks for having me, Maurice and J-Rod. This is awesome. Uh, my name is Mike Moroski. I am uh, <clears throat> um, the policy and partnership manager for Cradle Cincinnati out of Children's Hospital. Um, that's my day job. And I think everyone is here and probably knows me more for my full-time quasi-volunteer job as a board member at Cincinnati Public. So it's an honor to be here um, this Friday evening to uh, talk to you all about important things. So thanks for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for coming, Mike. Uh, I want to start off when we speak on important things. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in this room behind you, man? I'm really interested. I see some some interesting photographs and wall architecture. So what's up with that room behind you? So this, uh, this behind me here I got, this is my wife's medals from her races. That is my map of all of the Scotch regions of Scotland. Okay. The Black Lives Matter sign I made a long time ago that I held up. I haven't. I don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. I haven't for a long time. And when we uh, went to virtual meetings um, here for CPS, I started holding that up um, in front of it. So I just kind of posted it back there for when I do that. So this is our home office. Above me back here is the most important thing here. at Choices Cafe sign. Um, and the only coffee shop in Over the Rhine for a long time. You can't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it was a nonprofit coffee shop. Um, anybody could hang out there. You know, there were places you could get coffee if you were on the street and over the Rhine back in the day. But um, you had to like check all these boxes. You couldn't be inebriated. You couldn't this, you couldn't that, you couldn't cuss. And we just said, you can do whatever the hell you want as long as you're cool to people while you're here. Um, yeah. So that one's in there. But the real, the real art, as people may know, I'm also a musician. I'm a singer songwriter. And we right. have all of these wonderful wow. band posters and art um, that sort of line the walls out here. So that's kind of cool. That's impressive, man. That's definitely yeah. impressive. Yeah. I, I had to get a, an idea of what we were working with behind that. I so nice it. Home office. <laughs> yeah. Nice home office for sure. Yeah. So today, obviously, one of the hot topics that uh, you're behind is the, the racial discrimination policy that you're proposing that become that becomes implemented at Cincinnati City School Districts. So the anti-racism policy, how was it, in, what inspired this policy and who's behind it? Well, I assigned our general counsel um, the task of creating this policy on June 10th. And the first draft came before the policy committee on July 10th. Um, I, I happen to be the chair of that committee. Um, often policy committee's job is to review current policies and just sort of say current with like state law and federal law. Um, it's not often that new policies are created. Uh, and um, we had a couple um, in the works. We were looking at a lot of safety issues and all that. And the anti-racism uh, policy was interesting to me for a, a number of reasons. So I referenced my day job as policy manager at Cradle Cincinnati. Um, I don't think it's any secret, like everything else, that the black community is disproportionately impacted by infant mortality. And Cradle's goal is to get the infant mortality rate to zero. Um, we've been hyper-focused the past few years on the black infant mortality rate. That's not to say, obviously, we care about all babies dying. But when you talk about infant mortality, you're talking about black infant mortality, and you're talking about a black maternal health crisis, you're talking about a crisis um, in our hospital systems that are plagued with the same systemic racism that every other system is plagued with. That's a long way of saying these past few years I've had this job, I have really undergone some intense anti-racist training, implicit bias training, uh, racial equity training, et cetera. And um, it's really had quite an impact on me. You know, as somebody who considered himself a fairly woke white dude, um, raised by parents who taught me not to be an asshole and to be kind to people. It was really, it was really uh, uh, powerful for me to realize I'm not woke, nor can I be. 
and that my, my, my privilege sort of governs everything I do. And it really, it was really a powerful experience the past two years, um, explicitly going through this sort of training. And, you know, I work with um, vast majority of people I work with don't look like me. Um, and they offer me a lot of grace to ask questions and to learn more. And, you know, I've never had any illusion that the education system wasn't plagued um, by these racist systems more than most, um, you know, pipeline to prison is real. I was a teacher for 10 years um, at essentially an all white, all male school. And I saw the disparities there. Um, you know, concurrently, I had this life in over the Rhine with this nonprofit and affordable housing and this, this starkness always affected me. But now that I do policy for a living and I'll bring it back to the, the race, anti-racism policy, um, you know, I've come to see policy as the, the secret weapon um, in all of this that we don't use enough to dismantle these systems because um, the system's not broken. The system works exactly how it's designed to keep people who don't look like me down. Um, and if we can disrupt that internally, um, then that's good for everybody. Um, and especially it's good for the kids. And so that's where it came from. And then on June 10th, when I assigned it officially, that was right after um, George Floyd was murdered by police. And of course, uh, it's the, the, the latest in a number of black men murdered by the police. Mm -hmm. And um, it felt important uh, that we have a policy that calls out racism. And we have an equity policy, and that's good. That's good. But it's mm -hmm. not the same thing as saying black children are treated differently and worse in our system than any other race. There's no system in America where anyone underperforms black or outperforms white. And that is not a mistake. That is hundreds and hundreds, 400 years of intentional oppression. So that's where it came from. One more thing and I'll shut up, Jared, I promise. Um, I promise. Uh, this also was born out of the kind of uh, piggyback off of our strategic plan. Our strategic plan was released at the beginning of last school year. And it has five different um, uh, buckets, one of which is student-centered decision-making. While we were going through that process, I was advocating to include racial disparities in our student-centered decision-making because we had a lot of things where we're gonna measure um, graduation, we're gonna measure attendance, and they're all good. These are all great things. I was interested in codifying and putting in writing that we will measure and track racial disparities in everything from academic achievement, um, uh, disciplinary action, identification of um, uh, disabilities, uh, AP, it's everything. Yeah. And there was some real pushback um, in full transparency. There was some real pushback uh, um, on including racial disparities, though that phrase in the strategic okay. plan. Yeah. But um, I'm really good at being a pain in the ass and being tenacious. And uh, Ozzy Davis was on the board at the time. Yes. And Ozzy, uh, Ozzy's a man, and yes. I miss him every day. Um, but uh, he, he really stood there with me, and we, we were unwavering. And so it's in the strategic plan, which is great. Mm -hmm. I say all that because, in my opinion, as a, a governing person at this point in my life, having been a teacher, running nonprofits, all that, now I'm in this policy world. Um, if we don't codify something and say we're going to measure it, it doesn't matter. So we can say we care about our black kids and we wanna make sure that they have access to the same things that white students do. But if we don't measure that and hold ourselves accountable to it and put it in writing for the public to see, it doesn't matter, in my opinion. And so sort of taking that, we got it in the strategic plan right. and taking a lot of that language and then putting it in this policy mm -hmm. to be broader reaching, I think could be powerful. So, you said a lot, right? And I'm going to kind of pick apart some of the things that you said, but I want to actually speak to something that you said earlier, just to kind of paint a picture for the audience. You spoke on how you were a teacher for, I believe, 10 years in a predominantly white, all-male school. Yeah. And you spoke on some of the disparities that you've seen there. Can you kind of let us know what those disparities look like? Well, and so I'm glad you asked that. So to be a little clearer, I, I, I well, I can talk about disparities within that building for sure, but more so just the disparities of what this school was offered and where these kids, you know, how they were sort of coddled. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but just what it is. Um, I appreciate for, your, uh, your, your, your honesty. So, uh, Maurice, you know me well enough to yeah, I do. Yes, yes, don't beat yes. around the bush. Yeah, I know. Um, That's good. <laughs> um, but, but what I also saw was 
you know, this Syria in that building, there weren't a lot of black students. All the black students were in the remedial classes. Um, I had, I taught um, like remedial writing for lack of a better term. And it was usually um, mostly the black students in that sophomore class. Um, and I taught junior honors. And I had one black student in 10 years and he was from Africa. Um, and you know, these schools, uh, those, it was a private Catholic school, um, you know, would take money from the public districts to have kids there and then not give them the supports they needed while they were there. And that bothered me. I left that school and I went to uh, another school as an assistant principal for a couple years. I was fired from that job um, for saying I thought gay people should be allowed to get married. That's another story. Um, and life has turned out great. But the disparity of just you know, what these kids were given, um, and then what kids were given, uh, you know, right down the road in Cincinnati, uh, at our neighborhood school of Hayes Porter, for example, and the disparity is just stark. And, um, you know, out there at the school I taught at, they don't worry, they don't have conversations like this. And they don't have to worry about conversations like this. Um, they send kids on mission trips, they spend a lot of money to send them to go look at poor people. Um, and feel good about it. And, uh, you know, whether it's on purpose or not, and still this sort of white savior complex. But anyway, I'll stop. Um, but really, it was just a disparity between the two systems, and just how stark it was. And I came up in a system that looked very much like the one I just described. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of things that had I looked differently, I would um, probably not even be able to run for office. But because of the color of my skin, um, I was able to Get by. Yeah. One second. There you go, Joel. Hey, I appreciate you sharing that with us. You also mentioned uh, this policy. I believe last year you were speaking on the equity policy. Um, yeah. Past, but it's different from this anti-racism policy. Can you kind of explain some of the differences? Yeah. the the equi The equity policy um, is very broad. And it's very short, it's very good, but it, it speaks to just equity overall in that we will, you know, uh, make all of our decisions through an equity lens. And of course, equity being different than equality in the sense that equity seeks to give everybody, you know, what they need to succeed. Equality being, you know, everyone gets the same. And so I'm just going to read you a couple lines from the Equity and Excellence in Education, uh, if that's okay. And that, that'll help me sort of tee up the second part of your question. So the equity policy states that our students, staff, and stakeholders bring their personal backgrounds into our schools and the district is richer for it. Each of them has a legitimate expectation to have a barrier-free learning environment, um, et cetera, et cetera, and it outlines race, class, socioeconomics, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, cognitive, physical ability, diverse language, fluency, and religion. And it states that the, um, the, the district will focus on the individual and unique needs of each student's by committing to ensuring fairness, equity, and inclusion are essential principles of our school system, adopt a teaching and learning culture that's inclusive, provide high quality, culturally relevant, responsive curricula, et cetera. So it's very broad. And we reference it a lot um, as uh, there are a number of friendly faces and names I can see that attend our meetings and they hear us talk about it a lot. We're always talking about through the, the equity lens, our equity policy lens. Um, and that's good. but. But to me, it, it, it's not enough. And um, to me, the, the, there are numerous disparities, yes. But the disparity that is most glaring is the disparity between black students and every other student. And, it, and especially in an urban district, I feel it is incumbent upon us to call that out and create benchmarks that we can measure and address and mitigate for and eliminate um, so that we can say that we actually are living this um, equity policy you know already people have asked can we you know should we have um you know hispanic chamber of commerce should we have other races um be a part of our task force and our working group for this policy and you know obviously i i love all of these agencies and organizations rallying around all these, these different minority groups but the fact of the matter is this is why black people are continue to be held down literally and figuratively in this country because every time this conversation comes up another group gets tagged onto it by well-meaning white people 
And it's not, it's never going to go anywhere. The group that benefited the most from affirmative action in this country was white women. I love white women. My wife's a white woman. She's fantastic. Yeah. White women have, get screwed in this country. Um, people that look like me have advantages over them everywhere. But the fact is, is that black people and the African Americans in this country are consistently underperforming in every category, filling our prisons. We have more black people in slavery today than we did in the 1800s. And it's because when we bring this up, we're like, well, what about, well, what about this? Right? Well, what about, well, what about, well, we got to add in, but we don't. We have to talk about the racial disparity that exists between black people and every other race. And so that's where this one came from. And that's why I think it's important. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really happy to say that my six colleagues on the board do too. So this is not, any of these conversations that I just referenced that can be frustrating are not coming from my colleagues. Um, and that's, I, I think, good. Hey, Mike, really quickly, just, I mean, I know many people who are on may be uh, familiar, but can you name the other, your other board members that's on the CPS board with you? Sure. So we have President Carolyn Jones. Uh, we have Vice President Ryan Messer. We have Ben Lindy, Eve Bolton, Melanie Bates, and Pam Bowers. Thank you. Yep. I appreciate that. We, we have a, a few questions coming in uh, the chat box and, and we'll get to those pretty soon. I think one of the, another question that I want to ask you in regards to the policy. So you have the benchmarks, you know, I've reviewed the policy and there are certain data and criteria that you're looking to capture in regards to racial disparities. Once this data, so once you have the data, what are you looking to do? That's one thing. What are you looking to do with the data? And how long will it take before action is actually implemented based off the data that you all received? Are you looking at one or two years worth of data, a year worth of data? Can you answer that for us? So it's a good question. You know, right now the data that we're looking at is usually year to year or even quarter to quarter. I mean, you can pull discipline data right now for the third quarter. I would say fourth quarter, but the fourth quarter was really, you know, it was strange. Um, you can pull data from the third quarter right now, and I can tell you what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a lot of black students in alternative to expulsion and suspension programs um, and less white students. Um, and so we review that already and we've made some changes. So I think it also bears um, to be said that a number of the things that are referenced in this policy, like the restorative practices and things like that, we're all, we already do. Um, I think we can do them better. I think that we need to have the guts to talk about our restorative practice and all of these things we've implemented and teacher in services through the lens of there are systems of racism at work in our district that it is incumbent upon us to dismantle. So we look at it frequently already, but um, I would like to see it broken out more. And also the, to your question, if, if, if you're referencing our strategic plan where we did lay out this sort of criteria, because this, this won't be live for probably some time because we want so much feedback, um, so it'll take a while. But as far as what we called out in the strategic plan, we get updates on that quarterly as well. Um, and then Laura Mitchell, the superintendent, has kind of the ye yellow, red, green, where are we on all of this? Um, green is we're done, which we know isn't going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, yellow or red. And quite frankly, for most of the things I outlined, discipline, academics, um, identification, the special needs, et cetera, et cetera, were red or, or yellow um, on those right now. All right. Thank you for that, Mike. Thank you for that. I'm going to go to the chat box and ask a couple of questions. Dr. Kareem Moffitt, uh, she asked, Give me one second. Uh, I'm all for revisiting the racism policy. However, I'm concerned that students and parents and staff and complaining and feel left out that there is no recourse. Uh, I would ask Dr. Uh, Moffitt, what does she mean that there is no recourse? Um, is she talking about within the policy? Uh, but what is being done to address the current concerns that have already been addressed but not resolved? So I actually have uh, Dr. Mopsha right here. So I'm going to actually unmute her and let her explain herself. Absolutely. Hi, thanks for having, having me um, on. It's good to see you all. Hey, Mike, I just have a couple of questions. Um, with respect to the racism policy, I asked this question in the policy meeting. When people complain about being a victim of 
racism within the district. Parents have complained about principals. Students have complained about teachers. There have been complaints that have been registered. There has been no recourse of solving that complaint to their satisfaction that they have seen. So my question is, what is going to be the, the procedure if, if someone complains about being discriminated against, what is going to be the procedure? And how will the community know what the, what the procedure is and if it has been followed? That's what I mean by that. that it's, it's great to come up with a policy, but there are co current complaints that are in the, that are in the system already. So mm -hmm. that's my one question. Um, mm -hmm. I think we need to, and I asked this question in a policy meeting, someone was supposed to get in back in touch with me, but they never did. So that's concerning, yeah. but um, there, there, there have been complaints and um, I, that I know of, and I know they, that have, they have been registered that have gone nowhere. And students have said it at a board meeting and um, are feeling it. So I, I would like to know what that is. All right. So I'm going to first, give me one second. Um, Thanks for letting me know, no one followed up. So I just wanted to tee up an email to our uh, Dan Hoying and assistant counsel, Stephanie Scott with you on it, Kareem, um, so that they can answer your question. Cause I remember that and someone should have followed up. So I'll send an email and remind them that someone needs to follow up. Um, so without being able to speak with real, any real authenticity to the, the calls that had been made before now, um, uh, what I can say about this policy is it references procedures that have not been designed yet that will be designed upon passage of this policy. And one of the questions you asked, I've asked as well, which is what, what will it then look like? Because there, there and, and, and um, Carolyn Jones, President Jones um, has also brought this up because it's not, it's not, this policy is not just inclusive of students. This policy needs to be inclusive of students and students, students to teachers, teachers to students, teachers to teachers, teachers to bosses, bosses to teachers, parents to teachers, teachers to parents, everything. Yes. And a lot of what I think I heard in your question, and you can give me a little thumbs up or a thumbs down if I'm right or wrong on this, Dr. Moffitt, is a lot of the racism that is experienced is from parents who go to the district um, with a complaint that feel they're treated um, less than respectfully. I hear that. Um, and okay, good. It, and so that, that procedure is going to need to be outlined as I know, you know, but I'll say for the edification of everybody else here, um, who may not be as plugged in, um, when we pass a policy that is, that's our job, the board's job. After that, Laura Mitchell and her team then usually set up a set of procedures if necessary to follow so that they can be, have fidelity to that policy. Sorry. This would be a case where that will happen. I would not be surprised, and I, this is a teaser, I think it's the first I've said this publicly. Um, upon passage of this policy, I, I think it is prudent, um, and this is just my opinion, so this is not anything official, that's my, that's my, that's my, <laughs> my warning. Yes. Um, I think it would be prudent to have Maybe even an entire uh, person, I don't want to say department, I mean, we don't have a lot of money to spend right now with the COVID stuff, but like somebody needs to own this. Somebody needs to be the, the, the director of anti-racism. I made that up. But somebody needs to have a position that can track these things. Um, and, and, and it needs to go somewhere because if it doesn't have a person or place to go, it will die. Um, and so that's kind of where my head's at. Uh, but uh, Dr. Mavitz, right? These things happen and it goes down. We don't know what happens. Um, and so uh, it's going to be our job to ask for those reports. And again, and then I'll be quiet. In this policy, it references procedures. Um, the next draft that we get, it is going to be referenced more specifically. So I'll just pause there and I'm going to send that email to Dan and Stephanie. All right. Thank you for that, Mike. So, or, so I saw we have another question for Levon and Levon, let me know if I mis or mispronounce your name. Curious to hear Mike discuss how he feels school reopening is a racial injustice issue since COVID affects minority communities much more than white communities. 
Uh, I think it is uh, absolutely. And, and Mike, I'm sorry. Before, yeah, yeah. Before, before we go into that, can you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the reopening plan? Because I know there was an adjustment two days in, two days, you know, three days. Sure. Can you talk a little about that before you go into that? Sure. And I can actually, I can do that and answer that question at the same time. Cool. Um, so I was, um, as some people on this call know, I was a proponent of always doing mandatory six feet distance and the blended plan that was adopted. Um, every, every option kind of sucked, um, but you know, that's, that's an easy excuse to making hard decisions, which uh, I'm not want to do. Um, you know, there was real disagreement on the board. Some people said, you know, send them back if it's three feet, you know, who cares? Um, uh, and I, I was uh, adamantly opposed. We eventually, in a four to three vote, went to the mandated six feet distance and the blended model. Um, we have since, of course, uh, rescinded that and are now doing full virtual uh, for the first five weeks of school, um, at least, and hopefully be able to send students back um, privy to the public health knowledge I'm privy to doing, during, doing my, my full-time job. I, I, I'm hopeful that we can do it, but I, I, don't, I don't feel super great about it, but we'll, we'll see. But the, it is absolutely a racial justice issue for a number of reasons. Um, I, I feel that, you know, like everything, including what I work on in my job, but mater black maternal health, um, every, every single aspect of health disproportionately impacts the black community, every aspect. And um, this is no different. As we've seen, the governor has come out and declared uh, racism a public health crisis. Uh, you, you know, I have a lot of Republican friends, but I got to say, when you have a Republican governor coming out and saying that, that says something. Um, I, and this is not, we can't ignore this. So I think A, um, um, to leave on the point, uh, the, there's the health aspect that we have to be cognizant of, but then what made this decision so damn hard and what keeps me up at night is there's also all of the educational ramifications that are gonna disproportionately impact the black community with kids staying home. Um, and that's real, real hard because in 20 years, I'll still be in education in some way. I don't know how, but somehow. Um, and I fear that in 20 years, we will be sitting in rooms talking about the COVID effect <clears throat> on an entire generation of people. And certainly um, poor, poor folks too will be disproportionately impacted by this of all colors. So I'm not, I'm not you know, taking away from any of this, but it's going to, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I think it could disproportionately impact the black community. And so we had the choice of kids dying, or families or adults or what have you getting sick and dying or the educational gap. In my former life, I ran an agency called Upspring that Maurice just got hired at, which is great for Maurice and great for Upspring. Yes, yes. Upspring uh, is the only nonprofit. In the Can region. I give a plug? Can I give a plug really give quickly? Plug. We have our benefit go. badge coming up uh, August 22nd. Uh, I'll post a link on here. Uh, we support homeless youth. It's important. Hey. Go ahead, Mike, take it away. No, yeah, no, it, uh, it's a great agency. I was the executive director for a number of years and I uh, were the only agency in the region exclusively serving the educational needs of kids experiencing homelessness. And most of the bulk of our work was in the summertime. Um, so again, to Levon's point, now I bring up summer because I think summer is really important because that summer learning loss is, is part and parcel of what keeps the black community behind in academic achievement and certainly just the poor, poor folks in general. And that's that called the summer slide, right? The summer slide. That summer, slide. summer break is, is terrible for the majority of kids in our city. So while I can speak for myself, always look forward to summer, that is not the case um, for most kids. Um, I, I plan to, this is another first timer, I guess, Maurice and, and J-Rod, you got me fired up and Dr. Moffat always gets me fired up. Yeah. Uh, I, um, is, uh, I, I've talked to my wife a lot about this and I, at some point, I, 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 we need to start talking about year round school, um, particularly in light of this COVID thing. And, um, you know, we have summer off we, we have summer off because uh, we were an agrarian society. That's a little outdated. Um, I don't know a whole lot of the kids in Cincinnati that are going to work the farm uh, in the summer. Right. If they are, then they can go work the farm in the summer, but I don't think there's a lot of them. Um, and so uh, that issue is going to be um, compounded because right now what we're talking about is summer learning loss times about 100. So... Um, but I saw Levon had a follow-up, but want to see CPS work harder to bridge than rather risk their lives. Seems like we're throwing up our hands on alternatives. And that's fair, and I accept that, um, and I'll lean into that comment. 
um, <clears throat> we, we, we do need to work harder. There's no question. And I think, you know, thanks to a lot of community partners, this Connect Our Students initiative um, that Ross Meyer and others in the community have put together will, will be helpful, but it's going to take Meyer. a lot. He's Love a good Ross dude. Meyer, yeah. It's going to take a lot more. So thank you for that, because I agree wholeheartedly with you, right? As a parent and friend to many who have children in uh, CPS schools, I think this gap, what I'm concerned with is that obviously there are some parents in low income communities who don't have high school education, maybe their school or maybe their kids are going through work that the parents don't even know how to help them with, maybe they have time constraints. So I definitely think that's something that uh, is very concerning. I wonder what the board would do to kind of alleviate some of that pressure. And that's something we can talk about offline because I'm sure there's things that you all are working on behind the scenes to kind of bridge that gap as uh, Levon was uh, speaking to. So thank you for that. Oh, well, um, can, I say, can I say one more thing? Okay. Um, Absolutely. To, um, to Levon, uh, I, I, I cringed so hard and I, I wanted to apologize for the terrible mispronunciation of your name at our meeting. He knows what that means, but we can okay. move on. Okay. Uh, I want to I want to do a quick plug before we forget because I know we're we're moving at a rapid pace here. If you look in our chat, Maurice or Mike, earlier on they posted a link and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. This link is for individuals to actually s complete a survey in regards to the anti-racism policy. And can you speak a little bit more about the survey and what's on it and the importance of the survey? Yeah, so um, it's up there at the top, and um, it's a, it's has a twofold purpose. If you click that link, you'll be able to read the policy in full, um, but then you'll also be able to leave feedback, um, and you know, right there on the website. And um, the uh, <laughs> hey, you're welcome, Levon. The um, um, at our next policy committee meeting, which is September. Hold on one second, friends. September, fourth at um, three thirty p.m. September fourth, three thirty p.m. Um, our assistant um, counsel uh, Stephanie Scott and our communications director Krista Boyle. I, I, I asked at our last policy committee meeting that they would sort of collate the feedback and give us a presentation on what people had said to date. So get it in now um, if you want to have it reported out on that September policy meeting at 3.30, September 4th, 3.30 p.m. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the first time you've been able to leave uh, comments online. I wanted to make this accessible as possible to everyone. As I was saying earlier to Maurice and J-Rob, um, this policy has to be owned by the community. If it's not owned by the community, it's not going to be as impactful as it could be. It can't be some policy cooked up um, in a, a general counsel's office and approved by a few board members. So um, I think this, I, I need to give a shout out, if I may, to Assistant uh, General Counsel Stephanie Scott. She joined the, um, uh, uh, our team during all this COVID business. Actually, she's only been an employee of CPS probably a month plus. And uh, as soon as she got here, um, you know, this was assigned and she kind of took it on and did a hell of a job, I thought. Um, the draft she gave us was no joke and it certainly had room for improvement, but that's any initial draft does. But what I liked about her draft, and I think you will too if you haven't read it, is there's so much in it to pick apart. Um, it's not like a page. Um, you know, it probably should be shorter, if anything, to be honest. But uh, as a former English teacher, I'm, I'm a fan of making your point quick, uh, which you may not be able to tell by how I talk. But so that's where that's what that link is. Perfect. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, I do want to point out Brandon gave us some useful information in regards to year round summer or year round schooling. He stated that it's the agrarian society explanation which is actually a myth after all not much to do on a farm during summer summer break happened because rich families were withdrawing their kids to go vacation away from the city in heat so we can get back to the old days i'm assuming or we should at least try to get back to the old days where we had year-round schooling you know as a parent i would love that 
Uh, I want to speak to something that really stood out to me, aside from all of the policy enforcement, the curriculum and instruction, the hiring practices, right? The mm -hmm. things that go on behind closed doors, the, the people that we put into these institutions that are teaching our kids, that are teaching our teachers, right? Um, all candidates being considered for hire within the district will be asked appropriate questions to gauge their understanding of anti-racist practices. Additionally, candidates will be screened for implicit and explicit biases. Let me tell you why that's so important to me. I think if you have knowledge, right, um, if you have some experience, then obviously you can make better decisions. Uh, Mike, what was the motivation behind that? Can you speak a little bit uh, in regards to that hiring practice? Yeah, I can. I'm glad you highlighted that because that is the one paragraph that I wrote. Oh. <laughs> um, as, a, as, a, as I said, you know, Miss Scott uh, drafted this whole thing based on Southern Poverty Law Center research, uh, looking around the country and really the world. Canada's got some interesting stuff going on in this regard. Um, and um, uh, after I read the first draft and sort of did what I, I added that paragraph. So thanks for calling it out. Um, so that's important for a whole host of reasons. And um, the more I've learned, again, as a white dude um, working uh, in a largely uh, non-white, not largely, a non-white issue, again, my infant mortality work, um, uh, and doing what I do on the public school board, which is comprised of predominantly people who don't look like me, um, it is really, really important um, for people who look like me to be aware of these things. Um, we're not going to get rid of them. We being, I'm not speaking on behalf of all white people. I'm not that stupid. I'm not doing that. But like, I'll speak for me. I'm not going to get rid of my biases. I have them, same as anybody. Um, and I can be aware of them though, and I can work to mitigate them and I can catch myself. And the reason it's so important at Cincinnati Public to screen people before they get the job is because a lot of these uh, uh, folks aren't going to look like their students. And that's okay. Um, it'd be nice if we had more black teachers and we, we put forth a lot of dollars into this effort. But to me, and I've said this in our public board meetings numerous times, all of our recruiting efforts don't really matter if our black students don't feel comfortable in school. Now, a lot of them do. We have great teachers, but some don't. And if you don't feel comfortable when you're in school, you're sure as hell never going to say, you know what, I want to go back to that district and I want to teach. Now, some kids may say, I want to go back and make a difference. I did. I did not like school at all. Um, but again, I'm not the person we're talking about either. And so if we want more of our students to return to the district and teach our students and keep get that going, we need to make damn sure that when they're with us, they feel as if they are valued and that they see themselves in their classrooms in their teachers' words, if not in their skin color, in their textbooks, in their lessons, and in their tests, and they need to know that they are important. If we do that, we're going to see things change over years, over the years, over a generation, over two, over three, over four generations. This is a long process. The other thing is, when I was an executive director and an assistant principal, I was fond of saying, hire slowly, fire quickly. If you <laughs> hire slowly, first of all, you don't have to probably fire very often at all. And I'm not talking about we need to go through and clean house or anything. My point to that is to say, take our time when we hire people. Make sure that the folks we are getting are not only qualified to teach, but also understand that these issues exist. It's not going to be, well, if you don't pass the Harvard implicit bias, you can't work with us because everyone has bias. So that's not the issue. The issue is being able to address it and to mitigate it. And then when we offer professional development, which is also in the policy, which we already do a fine job with, we could do better. When we offer professional development, our, our teaching staff, and I'm gonna go out on a limb, and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to. Um, it's Friday afternoon and you guys got me going. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say a lot of our teachers, particularly, I see Miss Spinney on the call, and a lot of our younger teachers that are joining the Teach Force want to do this. They, they want to do this. This is part of the reason they got into this work is to educate, yes, that's the job, number one but also all of these other things. And so if you're aware of your biases, these professional development opportunities are gonna be more authentic. We as a district are gonna be able to provide the ones that matter. Cause right now we say, here's what we have. We don't know if they're what people need because we don't know um, all, all of that stuff. So I think that's why it's important. I appreciate that. Mike, you have our comment box going crazy. 
So uh, we appreciate that. You have people very much engaged. Uh, again, I just want to take a brief moment to say thank you for, for coming out. No problem. Uh, so, so with everything that you said, there was something that I really wanted to speak to. Um, what does it look like for what does anti-racism look like, right? How, how is that gauged in an experience at a school? Is it just simply by a student complaining? Because I can envision, obviously, a teacher saying, hey, no, I, I wasn't being racist towards that student. He continues to do this. So how do we gauge that? Do you have an idea? Is it just data? And, and I got another uh, add-on to that. Uh, you yeah. know, there's this people say, I'm not racist. And then there's people who are anti-racist. Can you uh, kind of give uh, the, the, the folks here uh, just a little explanation of the difference? Sure. Um, so for, for me, and I, yeah. you know, I, the, the we way love your I take, that's why I asked. Yeah, the way I see it is, you know, saying I'm not racist means that you yourself do not engage in racist practices and actively go out of your way to create situations where black people are oppressed. The problem with that is that you probably do. I do. My, my whiteness, by its very virtue, is oppressive. I am part of a white supremacist system. I am white. I've had certain advantages and benefits because of that. And you know, this is not a white guilt thing. I'm not, I'm not that guy. You gotta look somewhere else for that guy. I'm just recognizing it. And sure, it sucks, but it also means because of this whiteness that I can be disruptive and I can sneak into places and tear things down and rebuild them if I so choose. That to me is anti-racist, is taking this knowledge and seeking to dismantle systems that are intentionally designed to give white people a benefit and black people a detriment and, and change them. And so being anti-racist, I think, you know, and this is probably reductive and I apologize, but I feel it's kind of interesting like activism and advocacy in that advocacy may, may be a little more passive. That's terrible. I realize I'm just running through this, but activism seems to be a little more active, uh, hence, hence the word. And so I feel like anti-racist stance or an anti-racist uh, 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 perspective is one that is actively trying to dismantle these systems as opposed to saying, I'm not racist. And oftentimes that attitude is what perpetuates because you say, I'm not racist and I'm not part of the problem. Yeah, and oftentimes it's followed by some kind of microaggression, like, hey, I have black friends or, you know, something <laughs> like that. So, yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So, so and again, I want to follow that up with how do we identify what racism looks like or what a racist act looks like in the classroom? Is that just data based off the teacher? Is there a profile that's going to be compiled? What does that look like? And do you consider, and also, do you consider microaggressions in that as well? So I do, and I think my answer to J. Rod would have maybe cover covered this. Um, this is m my opinion. If a black student feels that he or she was treated in a racist manner, then he or she was. Mm, okay. And that's, that's, it's as simple as that to me. We don't, we don't believe people enough. Um, mm -hmm. We especially black people and especially black young people. Mm -hmm. so when a young person says this person made me feel that way. They did. And the same goes for teachers. The same goes for parents to Dr. Moffat's point. Um, you know, and we, we need, to, we need to believe. And now this doesn't mean when this happens either that the disciplinary action is going to follow. There are teaching moments in all of this. And in this policy, I think it outlines some of this, the ideal situation. And I was talking about this in policy committee last Friday. Yet in the ideal world, these all become teaching situations. If it's student to student, you sit down student, a student may seriously have no idea why this other student felt that way. And it's incumbent upon us to then teach them. I had a teacher um, who a number of my students, I worked in a school that was extremely diverse when I was an assistant principal. I was a dean of students. And there was a teacher that the students kept saying was racist. They just kept saying it. And, and you know, I called her into the office and she started crying. And she was very upset. You know, white tears are real. <laughs> and, and I told her, I said, you know, look, I go, I understand this is upsetting to you. But, and she said, I'm not racist. I go, that's fine. But all of your black students think you are. 
<laughs> and so let's unpack it. And let's talk about it. And you know what? Her and I ended up getting pretty tight. And she really dove into it and realized like, oh, gee, well, because Maurice, I think a lot of it was the microaggressive stuff that she really, and this teacher, I don't think she, she did not wake up saying, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to pick on these black students. I'm going to make them feel like crap. She didn't. No, no. But the fact of the matter was, that's how they felt. So, but that's not, that's a pretty philosophical answer, J-Rod. Uh, admittedly, I realize that. And it, that's a per, that's my opinion. So mm -hmm. I don't have like a, 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 a sort of a spell well, out. Yeah. yeah. But that's what we're going to have. And in here, of course, it also talks about that each of the schools will have some version of this policy or that criteria in the building so mm -hmm. that people can like point at it and say, remember, we don't, we don't do that. So stay tuned for that. I know you mentioned the communication in here. So I, I know we promised you to, to get you out of here at a decent hour. So we're going to start wrapping up. I want to give you the floor uh, for any last comments, um, just any last statements that you want to want to make on this platform. Sure. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. And if to do that, if I could start with Miss uh, Spenny, I just her her, her comment caught my attention. Um, and that's kind of what I would like to maybe use as my jumping off point. She said that having a duty to teach about uh, sy systematic racism, um, so many of our students don't even realize they're being oppressed by the system in which they find themselves. If we don't teach them to question and think critically about these things, they will continue to be ruled by the very white ideology that is our current state of education. Um, I think that is a really powerful statement and we're happy that Ms. Finney teaches in our district for this reason and others, um, because if we, if we don't, if the goal of this is not to empower students of color to take the power back, to redesign these systems that are extremely guided by white supremacy, then it's all for naught because it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because of this, this policy. This policy can create a framework that will empower parents, and students, and community members, and teachers like Andrea and, and community members like Dr. Ma, et cetera, et cetera, to, to have these conversations and to hold me accountable. At the end of the day, that's what the power of policy is, is to hold me and my six colleagues accountable. Because if we do this and things don't change, then you can say you're full of shit. And people have said that. I get that a lot. It's part of the job. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I run into it. I love it. Uh, my wife, Katie, will tell you. I, I get some, you know, some of the emails. It's like, whoa, whoa, we're going to new territory. But there are people on this call. I won't call them all out by name again. But there are people on this call that are real good at holding me accountable. And, and we need that. And it's hard to hold uh, a system governed by racism, which let's be super clear is all of our systems. So, you know, uh, when we were talking about the strategic plan and getting the racial disparity and people say, well, we don't want to call that out. It's like, look, <laughs> right. we, but, we, but it's real and yeah, it's right. in every system. And yeah. so wouldn't it be great if we actually said we see it and we're going to do something about it? Um, so... Uh, you know, the, 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 my closing thoughts are you, y'all need to hold us accountable. Y'all need to make sure that this thing keeps moving. I can promise everyone that's listening that I will continue to, you know, shoulder this through the process, but it's, it's not mine. It's not the districts, it's yours. Um, and the, the, the way I can be the most helpful is to continue to move it through the process because in large government bureaucracies as an activist turned elected official, I learned in my twenties, which was longer ago than I want to talk about, but it was a while ago. I learned in my you look 20s. good, Mike. You look good, Mike. For sure. I appreciate that, Maurice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have somebody in the system that's moving it along, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to all the council meetings you want. You can talk for all the two minutes you want. Doesn't matter. Um, that you got to have so much. So I will show it. I will, I will help move this along. But I would definitely we just, I need everyone to share the link get people to give the feedback. And then also, um, J-Rod, I want to, I want to, I want to re-ask J-Rod's question to this group and to anyone that's watching on Facebook right now. And the question he asked that is going to stick with me from this call all weekend, and I'll think about it tomorrow morning on my walk, is how do we define this? And how, how what does it look like to be able to say that was a racist act? Again, in my mind, it's anybody who says it was, it was. 
If somebody tells me, Mike, you said something in that meeting that made me feel some kind of way, made me feel like this. And even, it, and this happens, mm -hmm. you know, again, I'm as guilty, these microaggressions, Maurice, as anybody. And in my, the white brain, I'm gonna give you a little insight into white people. Uh, don't tell anybody. Okay. But our brains have this yeah, but mechanism. And the white brain goes, yeah, but, <laughs> it's the first thing we do, even me. Yeah, but when we see a black person killed by a cop, yeah, but was he, maybe he was, yeah, but. Yeah, when you, when, you watch the, when you watch the news, uh, you know, when the news posts say things on Facebook, I just read just the comments and that, that really yeah, but. shows me a lot. Yeah, but. Yeah, but, and, and, and part of what, what uh, uh, again, not speaking on behalf of the white race, but part of what we have to get better at is recognizing the yeah, but. So again, when people say to me, Mike, you know, you made me feel this way and you said that, my brain might say, yeah, but I didn't, you know me. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. That's my point. So that's my point is that it doesn't matter. It made somebody feel that way. And so you have to lean into that and take it on. And that's not easy. And so none of this is easy, but it's important if we want to actually live in a country where black lives matter is more than a hashtag. Mike, I, I, wanna, I wanna say this one, I will have you on any day of the week, man. You have been <laughs> phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. The, the way that you have not shied away from questions, the way that you've leaned in, I truly appreciate. I'm glad that you are on the Cincinnati Public Schools Board. I'm glad that you are putting forth and pushing policy that is going to change what racism looks like within our schools. I want to say, I wish we would have had time to talk about the lack of black teachers in schools, um, especially with there being a majority of black students. Also, I'll give you an example of something that I've heard a student say that they felt was racism. And I, I, I would love to talk to you at any point offline. Yeah. Um, I was told to take my hoodie off and then I seen my teacher look at leaving the room and she seen Sophia with her hoodie on and didn't say anything to Sophia. So I'll, I'll leave you with that and then we could definitely talk offline. Before I, let, before I leave, one of my closing things I want to say, Maurice Stewart, one, congratulations on your new position with Upspring. But two, I don't think people know how essential you are to what we do, how you work the boards. And I just want to publicly thank you for doing all the work you do because you are the engine that makes this thing run. So thank oh, you so much. Well, 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 I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, Mike, I uh, follow your lead. You know, I'm on the uh, CCPA board. Um, and, you know, we, we definitely, you know, pay attention to what's going on with CPS and, you know, try to apply it to our students because, you know, we share many of the same students. Yeah, man. And we're, I think we're all responsible for all of our students. So, yeah, man. Uh, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. I know you have a hard stop at 7 o'clock. Um, Mike, really quickly, tell us about your walks, man. I've I, I seen the article. Tell us a little bit about that. I know you got a couple minutes. And I know you'll wrap it all up. All right, here. I'll give you a couple minutes. I like yeah. talking about that. So, <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so, uh, uh, I, um, uh, in December, I had uh, elbow surgery and I got a physical and I weighed about 250 pounds, 245 pounds. And um, I knew that I needed to reclaim control of my physical well-being. I had started a mindfulness journey about a year before that in 2018, doing yoga. And just I realized I was going through the motions. And this all kind of actually coincided with a lot of that racial equity work I was talking about. Um, and I think there's a lot to um, recognizing implicit bias to recognize that you have to be mindful. You can't just be going through the motions. I was going, Maurice, you know me well enough. So does Kareem and Rick. And uh, I, I'm busy. I'm, I, and I like to be busy. And I run from thing to thing. And I, I was doing too much of that. Anyhow, um, I was getting my head right. But my body wasn't right. right. And so I decided I wasn't going on a diet. I was just going to embrace a healthy lifestyle. Started January 6th, just walking the stairs in our, our building where I, we live. I six floors from my car to uh, where we live and um, it was hard. Uh, it was real hard and I just kept doing it. And then, uh, you know, Katie was pregnant with our son, James. And I knew, you know, I'm not, I'm not old, but I'm not young, I'm 42. And when James is 10, I wanna be able to do stuff with him and not be like, you know, dad can't get off the ground. Uh, dad can't go throw the ball with you. And so he was a big motivation too. And certainly Katie as well. I didn't wanna just be this unhealthy, you know, whatever, sick person. Anyhow, speed the story up, this COVID stuff happened. And, um, 
you know, and I recognize this is also part of my privilege, being able to do this, go on these long walks with my son. You know, this is uh, doing what I do for a living. And I also sit on a statewide child care advocacy board. Things are bad. They're hard. Um, and, you know, how can I, how can I be helpful? Uh, you know, again, for James and for Katie, getting healthy was a part of it and getting mindful is a part of it, but also for the positions I've been afforded the opportunity to have, a lot of people put their faith on me to, to do and make these decisions. And I think a good way to honor that is to work my ass off physically too. And so I, I, I walk 26 miles on Saturdays now, uh, started with my six floors in my building. I've lost 90 pounds. Um, you know, I, I, I feel fantastic and I, the, the yoga and the, all that stuff was all right for my head, but I've never really been in good physical shape, honestly, really my whole life. I boxed a little bit when I was uh, 19, but everyone's in good shape when they're 19, yeah, right, <laughs> so, right. you know? Um, so it's great, man. And you know, it's time with my son and he doesn't remember it, but I know enough about childhood development to know that all this time with him staring at my face for three hours every Saturday morning for an hour and a half, Monday through Friday is, is a big deal. And, um, you know, I get to, I talk to him, I tell him all this stuff. I tell him, look, you're a, you're a little white dude in this, in this world and you have a responsibility. Everyone's going to give you what you want, but you're going to have to give a lot of it back because that's what real equity looks like. And so hopefully I'll remember all the wise shit I'm saying to him now when he's well, old we'll, enough. We'll record this. So <laughs> yeah. At least he'll remember he'll, he'll get this. Right. <laughs> so well, it's great, man. But I, I feel great. Thanks for asking Maurice. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That. No, not, again, thank you, Mike. Um, it has been amazing having you on. I know you got yep. a hard stop at seven. It is seven. So yep. pop off if you need to, but thank Peace. you, Mike. Appreciate you, buddy. Right. Um, th I did want to mention to any of the listeners as well, uh, next week we will have a uh, social justice circle with Cincinnati Youth Collaborative. They're uh, outstanding students. Um, they're the winners for this year. Uh, prior to their, um, in October, they're having their Dream Makers uh, celebration. So I, don't, I think many of the people here know uh, Cincinnati Youth Collaborative is essential. They do great things with Cincinnati Public Schools. And um, I am on that board as well. And uh, we're going to highlight these students and social justice. So. Look forward to that next week. Uh, Gerard, any closing things? No, not at all. Once again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Maurice. This has been a great session. I appreciate you, too. All right, perfect. And I'll get this uploaded. Uh, unfortunately, it was unable to connect to Facebook Live. Uh, it, it wouldn't connect. All know. good. But but I will get the link, and we can share that out. because I know people. Come on, man. I'll share it, too. Of course. Thank you all. You have a good all one. Right, okay? Much perfect. love. Enjoy.